me, Dr. Safia Misra is associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Memphis. Uh, she's an expert in logistics, and before joining the University of Memphis, she worked as a research assistant professor at the National Center uh, for Smart Growth Research and Education at the University of Maryland in College Park. She's a member of the Transportation Economics Committee of the TRP and Flight Transportation Economics Regulation Committee of the Transportation Research Board. Is part of uh, our consortium, and uh, we are looking forward uh, for his uh, talk today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. So, um, Alini, are we ready to go? Yes, we're good. We're great. Okay, you can hear me all right? Yes, it's great. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, those are in the West Coast, still good morning. And uh, thank you for joining this webinar. So, today we're going to talk about highly automated technologies for trucks and what is the perspective of the industry, meaning people who own, operate uh, different types of trucks, whether uh, they own it, they contract it, they lease it, so uh, they, they operate in the logistics and, and truck movement business, what are their perceptions? and that would be our topic of uh, discussion. So with the one hour that we have, I will take approximately 30 to 35 minutes and the rest of the times we'll have for Q&A. And I will try to answer all of, your, all of your questions in the webinar. And if there are any remaining questions that we can answer, always uh, you can reach out to me via email and we'll have a contact email towards end of the presentation. So we're going to talk about um, especially five different things in today. So first we're going to introduce what is our topic of discussion and then uh, providing the background and, and motivation for why do we want to look into this specific research topic of uh, highly automated technologies and trucking industry. So to address the problem, we had to go with the survey route. So we'll talk about the survey design and some preliminary results from the survey. And beyond survey results, we're going to talk about um, the modeling effort that we carried out to understand perceptions because the survey data only gives us a very deterministic view of what the data told us, but not necessarily from a probabilistic or likelihood perspective. So in that, we have, we have to look into various types of modeling framework. So that's what we're going to talk there. Then we'll see some results of the of the modeling and then some discussions and then we'll conclude the presentation with looking into what else is going on in this domain as well as what what are some of the things that uh, we are doing as a part of this fmri project so in terms of introduction if we look into the trucking fleet uh, nationwide what we see is that um, there are about 273 million on-road vehicles. So there are vehicles operate on off-road as well. We're not counting those, but 273 million on-road vehicles in year 2018, according to Bureau of Transportation Statistics data. Out of the overall fleet that we see of 273 million out of that trucks, trucks meaning the summation of single unit trucks, and combination trucks. So that composition is about 4.8% 4, 4 of all vehicles. So about 5%, not kind of a major fleet source that, that we can think of, but trucks carry all the good movements that, that we have in majority of the commodities that uh, probably more than 80% of the commodity weight being carried by trucks. So by no means that 5% is a less composition or less uh, share of the total fleet. So out of the 4.8%, if we look into how much is combination trucks and, and how much is single unit. So if we look into combination trucks, there is a graph on this slide. So x-axis essentially tells us uh, the time starting from 1970 to 2020. And we have two y-axis. One is the primary y-axis that says the that shows the 
the number of vehicles that have increased over over time or somewhat kind of level remained remain the same and y axis shows their share so if we look into combination trucks then we see about 2.9 million of combination trucks about 1.06% and that share has not over changed much over time so that share is more or less the same there are a little bit of dip but it's very small and comes back in the very next year so more or less the percentage of combination unit trucks is little over than 1% if we look into single unit trucks that share is is relatively high so that's about 3.77% and number of single unit trucks are like 10.3 million so this is a perspective in terms of the truck fleet share nationwide in terms of single unit trucks and combination trucks. Now, if we look into vehicle miles of travel, the situation is different. So the story is very different when, when it comes to VMT. So total VMT in 2018 is over 3,200 billion. And even the fleet composition of freight was about less than 5%. The VMT represents 10%. So compared to 4.8% of vehicle share. So out of that, if we look into combination trucks, look at 1% of combination trucks in terms of fleet share contributing to close to 6% of VMT. So the purple curve, the same color that we used in the previous slide has, has, has increased significantly representing that combination trucks uh, move a lot, meaning that trip lengths are very high that is why contributing to larger VMTs. Whereas the share of single unit trucks is about 3.72%, very much similar to the percentage of fleet that has been owned that is also a similar percentage of VMT. So that is essentially telling about the trip lengths of each of the types of the truck. So what it tells us that these two slides tells us that trucks do share a major portion of the VMT and what we need to look into is that when there is discussion of different type of technologies coming, not essentially through the level of automation of one through five, but various components of those technologies, how is it going to affect the trucking industry? So what are the various types of technologies we are looking into? This slide is a busy slide, but it shows or different type of technologies that, that are somehow integrated into SAE level of automation one through five. So active braking system, active steering system, active warning system, and camera monitoring system. So in terms of active braking systems, so what is ongoing is automatic emergency braking. So if a level five autonomous truck we are talking about, it should have emergency braking because of interruptions from its environment and various other type of road obstacles or air disc brakes essentially enhancing or augmenting the current braking system as well as adaptive cruise control then in terms of keeping the steering essentially on the lane and taking care of to not too much of lateral movement so there is something called as lane keep assist as well as lane centering two different type of technology as well as adaptive steering control. So those fall into the category of active steering systems. In terms of active warning systems, such as lane departure, forward collision, and blind spot detection, those essentially fall into the active warning system. And then camera monitoring systems, such as cameras monitoring what is happening in the vicinity of the vehicle, which is moving. So that is in-care facing driver training. That, that means essentially, Driver can see what is going on and react if needed, if the level of automation is not five. Then we're looking into forward facing event, meaning what happens uh, in the forward direction as well as side rear view mirrors, essentially telling the lateral position uh, uh, what are problems happening. So these are different type of techniques that go with various levels of development with level one through five. So those were the technologies that we considered in this study attaching each of these features to different level of automation. So what is our motivation is that when we looked into share of future truck VMT can be even higher what we see today, 
Why is that? It's because of less stress of driving. Uh, drivers can spend much longer time essentially taking goods from point A to point B. The hours of service regulation can change over time, providing larger time windows because the stress of driving is less. So what would be its impact on our roadways? Do we expect more vehicles or smaller vehicles operating uh, for a longer period of time? It's something that is unknown and uh, only we can explore at this point um, as analysts. So in terms of cost impact, because that is where industry is essentially going to look forward to is that what is the cost to the driver as well as what is the trade-off cost to the technology? Is there a trade-off and compensation between the two costs? And industry is going to look at, is it possible to maximize profit by, by minimizing cost as much as possible in, 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 in trade-offs of both indicators? Now, what we look into also in terms of investments or looking into the impact of cost is that what is the perception of different sizes of companies, such as small companies, medium companies, large companies, depending on the number of employees that they have or the areas that they serve. So but when we look into these complexities, then the industry perception of highly automated trucks becomes critically important. And that is what, why we need to look into further, what does industry think? We can think about OEMs coming up with different types of development, but what is the perception of, of the industry is what in this research we attempted to explore further. So in terms of data, we looked into a national truck fleet uh, ownership companies. So this, we categorize those by their employee size. So meaning a company having 50 employees or less, we categorize that as a small company, essentially operating on a smaller local scale or regional scale, medium company having majority wise region wide uh, operations, such as employees having 50 to 500 number of employees and large companies having more than 500 employees and also operating national scale as well as some level of international operation as well. So we designed a survey to understand what are the industry perceptions. So some more information about the survey is upcoming in the next slide. So when we talk into survey and in terms of companies, uh, I would like to add a caveat here is that we're talking about companies and not individuals. So when we do individual based survey, the percentage of individuals driving on their own car is much higher than companies you know, operating a set of trucks. So we should not be aiming for a very large sample size considering the number of companies we have with owning or contracting or leasing vehicles or involved in business is, is different. For example, Starbucks as a company do not own any Starbucks fleet, essentially lease, then they would not fall in our survey data set. Uh, so we're talking about companies who have some level of truck ownership or operation, not necessarily you know, looking into uh, just, just, just um, outsider vendors to do their service. So ownership becomes an important part in the data collection. So it's difficult to obtain sample size because we need to know how many companies operate nationwide. So we did essentially look into various types of survey data or various types of data sets, such as you know, Info USA in terms of uh, establishments and based on the fleet ownership category. Uh, getting nationwide data is, is, is difficult, um, but we tried our best contacting various states. And based on sample size formula of you know, our main and, and Cochrane's formula, we came up with minimum, we need 400 samples um, because less than that, we may not be able to get a good representation of our observations or cannot provide any uh, kind of conclusion. Uh, so we looked for, aimed for minimum of 400 samples. And if we can get more than that, that is, that is better. And also I'd like to give a caveat here is that uh, one would think why a company would like to provide their perception. So it's not an individual providing a travel diary in a regular survey data. So getting survey preferences of companies is not that easy compared to individuals. Also, companies have their own uh, 
uh, proprietary knowledge that they would not like to reveal. So uh, there are a lot of complexities in collecting industry data compared to individual data. So that we had to go through, but uh, we, we, we were reasonably enough to, to, to collect the data. So how did we collect the data? So we hosted uh, the survey data on Qualtrics uh, on, 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 on our university website, and, and which had a web-based link as well as an app. So all the responders who responded to the survey were paid for their time. So meaning people were not taking the survey for free because we were serious to collect their data, which involves their proprietary knowledge as well as business confidence and business knowledge of their own company. So we had to do a paid based survey. So the survey existed for or lasted for two weeks in the month of July this year. And the average time to complete the survey was for about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how fast and how involved one is doing the survey or multitasking. So we had 60 questions. Uh, initially, the survey began with some socioeconomic and demographic characteristics, then went with uh, company characteristics, then went into what are their uh, preferences towards various types of technology benefits, technology barriers, and then some stated choices, which we'll discuss in the subsequent slides. So after the survey was complete, then we administered the data for quality check as well as if the surveys were done in less than five minutes, then we know that it's not a valid sample. So we looked for time and essentially made sure that the survey data that we use is, is as much as possible error free. So that QAQC, uh, we did post data collection. So what are some of the uh, things that we learned from the survey data? So let's look at the, what the data itself tells us. So there are five things here, but let's look at the only first pie chart at this time. So that is mentioning about age. What is the age composition of the person of the company who responded to the survey? So one important thing in this pie chart is that the age varies from 5% of minimum to a maximum of, uh, I think, about 14%, 17%. So we don't have any age category less than 5%. That is a good thing. And also not an age category, say more than 25%, because we have more than four categories of age. So what we see is the highest uh, percentage of people who responded to the survey uh, who have a position in their own company and has, and has the ability essentially to make a say in their, in their company's decision was in the age category of 36 to 40 years. That is about 17%. Whereas age composition of people under 25 years of age, which is kind of reasonable, they would not make it to that level of a company. So that percentage was less, which is about 5%. Then all other age categories that, that we see here is somewhere close to about 10% range. So the point of that pie chart is that to show that the survey is a representative sample and not necessarily biased towards any age category. Now let's look into education. In terms of education, what we see is the higher education level is a bachelor's degree. That means people making decision have at least a bachelor's degree. That's what our data showed when the survey was, was ongoing. Um, the least was people having master's or doctoral degree, not necessarily that frequent in terms of industry, but still composed about 8%. And after bachelor's degree, also the second category of education was people having high school or some sort of a uh, GED um, type of uh, education, so about 22%. That also data shows that it's not essentially biased towards an education category. Now we looked into tenure, meaning number of years the employees served in their company. So here we see is the highest one is about six to uh, 10 years that people have served and they have some say uh, that's about 19%. Three to five years is highest, is 23%. And essentially, at least is the one which is more than 20 years of experience. Uh, maybe people change companies and very low percentage, which is what we expect is about 4% of people having more than 20 years of experience in one company. In terms of number of drivers the companies had, so what we looked into the highest one is somewhere 
in between 11 to 50 drivers, about 21% of that. And if we look into over 2,500 drivers, about 16% of responders said that they had more than 2,500 um, drivers operating on their truck fleet. So the lowest one is about somewhere about 100 to 250, uh, but but we see, we get a good categorization of you know how many um, drivers companies essentially operate with their fleet. In terms of areas of business, we wanted to ensure that our data set does not include companies specifically located in one region of the country. So though we did not ask for exact location because companies would feel you know, kind of uh, that is uh, revealing their exact location. So we had to go with region where companies feel essentially more free to provide information. So we see a moderately distributed uh, distribution in terms of geographical areas of presence. Uh, so about somewhere close to 20% in the, in the five regions that, that we talked about. Um, there, there is a very small percentage. They say that they have outside business as well. They have presence in the US, but their headquarters are elsewhere. Uh, that's a very less percentage, uh, about one to two percent. But uh, but the majority of the companies are essentially in the uh, US itself having headquarters. So this is essentially a, a little bit more into the data set. In terms of their market share, uh, companies it said that 40% operate nationally and about 28% regionally, 16% locally, and about 16% companies said they have international presence. So that means it, it, it's a good representation of the data. In terms of vehicle ownership, one of the things of our data set is that majority of the companies that we see, the highest percentage of companies have their own fleet, not necessarily the rent or contract. So 57% of the companies have their own fleet. So that, that is something, uh, though it's not, it's, it's probably people who work in the trucking industry have a fair idea, but you know, for us working in the university to understand what is the trucking industry perspective, we see that ownership is a big part of the truck fleet operation. We'll see later, what is the perception of people owning the fleet versus renting and contracting? How do they say what type of fleet they prefer in, in the future later on. But here is giving a snapshot of vehicle ownership. In terms of cargo types, what type of cargo these companies essentially operate with? Uh, either they do machinery or foodstuffs or textiles or construction equipment. Those are, those are essentially more, but there's a good representation of, of other categories as well. In terms of number of trucks we did, uh, the average trip length, the highest uh, trip length is is about more than 200 miles. That's represent about 33% of responders. Uh, whereas over five uh, over 500 is 31%. Between 200 to 500 is 33%, and 51 to 200 is about 28%. So more or less a good spread of trip length between those categories. What we see is less share of companies operating 50 miles, meaning just last mile and nothing else. So we didn't have that many major companies or that many companies in our survey data represented 8% of the, of the sample size. All right, so what type of stated preference questions we asked then in the survey? So we asked four scenarios based on the additional cost of automation. So if we take the regular trucks that companies have right now or with some level of automation, they have level one trucks, that is our baseline. That means our alternatives become level two, three, four, and five. So including the base, we have five. Excluding the base, we have four levels of automation. Now, our scenarios are developed based on cost. Cost is not the only factor, but we are saying here based on cost. So in scenario one, we're telling that, would you be willing to prefer a level two autonomous truck by paying additional $10,000 to what you pay currently to owning a truck. So that is the preference that they will choose, that in scenario one, level two, or if they would like to choose, they, they prefer level three automation makes much more sense to them, and they would like to pay additional 20,000. So we're talking about scenario one. And similarly, if they would like to 
own level five truck by paying additional $40,000. So the additional cost in scenario one increases by $10,000. In scenario two, it increases by starts from 7,500 and increases additional 7,500 7, in increasing level of automation. And then scenario three increases by 5,000, scenario four increases by 2,500. So if we look into scenario one, which becomes more expensive, scenario four is the least expensive. So what are their preferences to owning various levels of automation? So those were the preferential or stated preferences we asked them in the survey. So how did they choose the survey? This is a snapshot how the Qualtrics survey was looking. So they would see, okay, what does level zero one and one prefer or, or provide me in terms of benefit? Uh, is the driver needed? Yes. Platooning capabilities? No. Uh, capability to sync with other vehicles? No, unlike that. So those are features of different levels of automation we provided with additional cost and they can choose which level of automation they prefer in the survey, hit next to go to another scenario. So this is uh, a snapshot of scenario four as presented to the survey responder in the Qualtrics survey. So what does the result or the survey data itself tells us? The survey data tells us is that these are four scenarios. Let's look into one figure right now, scenario one, which is the expensive scenario. So here we have level two, three, four, and five, and under each level, there are three categories. That means what is the perception of smaller industry towards level two, medium industries to level two, and large industry to level two. So we see that higher inclination of smaller companies to transition to level two is, is highest among medium, for example, compared to medium and large. And large companies are also kind of uh, much more preferential to, to go for level two. But comparing to level two and level three, these companies feel that level three is much more beneficial to them than level two. Similarly, level four is more beneficial than level three, and level five is more beneficial than level four. And in all categories, what we see is that smaller companies are much more risk uh, taking, possessing risk-taking behavior, and medium to large companies are a little bit risk averse, where large companies are risk averse the most. In terms of what percentage of vehicles or they have ownership of standard is, is the last call. So if we look into other scenarios as well, so this is percentage of organization. So as the scenarios essentially go with less cost, from scenario one to through scenario four, the percentage which the upper limit was 15% here, in scenario four, it increased to 20%. That means they are more willing to pay less cost to have a greater level of automation, which makes sense, uh, is that they're, they're more attitudinal. But here, with less cost, they want to have actually level two vehicles because it is readily available than waiting for level five. If it is least cost, they can pay right away, have level two automation, and take the benefits instead of waiting for longer time to have level five. So those are some of the data sets uh, related from the data itself, some insights that, that, that we got. Now, in terms of our methodology, um, so since this is a stated preference data, we had to choose uh, utility-based uh, random utility theory, or what we call as the uh, choice modeling framework. So here we have five alternatives, uh, level uh, standard, and then level two through five, that what is the alternative for your company? Alternative I choosing for company N is a deterministic component, VNI, plus an error component that we don't know because we can only ask questions that, that we feel representative, but there may be many questions that, are, that those are not included in the survey, but still have an impact in the purchasing decision. That's the error term. So each your error term is IID, meaning independently and identically distributed uh, using Gumball. So that means uh, that model follow multinomial logic or our standard family of MNL. So then at the end, what we will be receiving is likelihood or probability of uh, a company in choosing an alternative I that would be a value in between zero to one. 
So that's what we will get. But there are limitations in terms of uh, MML. So because it does not capture many of the things that a mixed logic model model does, such as random test variation, meaning every individual uh, perceives a specific alternative differently. That that's not something captured essentially in MNLs, and as well as uh, unrestricted substitution patterns we have, and there is a correlation in terms of unobserved factors over time because we're talking over time here. So I will not spend much time on here, but wanted to say that we looked into both multinomial logic as well as mixed logic as a type of framework. And mixed logic since looks into each individual perspective, that means we have to go with simulation. That means every individual will have a likelihood of perception towards a, a specific alternative uh, when it is representing that form. So which would be time consuming in terms of its uh, uh, in terms of its its computation time for convergence, which we'll talk a little bit uh, later. So, what are the type of models we did? So we uh, developed three models. One is what we call as alternate specific based cost, but the model type is multinomial logit. Model two is a generic cost, and multinomial logit as well. Model three is individual specific cost, and is a mixed logit. So in total, we have. 12 models. How come? We have four scenarios and three models for each scenario. So we have to draw conclusions from these 12 different type of models. And our webinar is not an enough time essentially to go through details of all 12 models and what each one provides us, but we will look into some of the summaries and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, later on today as well as you know uh, in the future via email. So what, when we looked into mixed logic models, we had to go with random draws. So we went with 1,000 random draws for each individual, and it takes about half a day. Uh, we also tried to increase the random draws from 1,000 to 10,000, and that significantly incre increases the computational time, meaning model convergence becomes multiple days. So those who are not familiar with mixed logic, I would say that a random draw like, for example, what we do when we take, take about age. So we did not ask what is your age, write a number. We just gave a threshold, as you saw in the pie chart. Now we assign a random age between that start and end values, meaning if the age is between 25 to 30, we assign a random uniform distribution and then assign that age between 25 to 30 to that individual. That's essentially what we do when we talk about random draw. And all the variables, those have similar type of ranges with a lower and upper limit. We had to draw, uh, we have to make random draws instead of taking midpoints. And those respective essentially decisions essentially went into model estimation. So now we look into some model results. So I see that I'm over 30 minutes and I will try to wrap up in next five to 10 minutes. So here we are looking into scenario one and we're looking into effect of age. So what we see, let us look into the first table here, which says model one, which is alternate specific MNL. So it says that when age is a continuous variable, people of age are, irrespective of age, people are preferring essentially level one. And this magnitude 0 0.02 is highest. That means level one, what we have, we are good with that. Level two perception is little less than level one. That means we're still, we're okay to adopt level two. Level three, four, and five are negative. That means with increasing age, then people with more age essentially might not be that much intended to adopt higher automated technologies for trucks. So, but still, with age, what we can say is that the level of interest towards higher level of automation with increasing age is, is, is a trend, is what we see in model one. And what we see here is that the p-value, which tells that the significance level, everything is significant except level five. That means we should not be drawing any conclusions for level five, but at least we are very sure at 95% level of confidence so p-value, we should be looking at 0 0.05 or less. So we're getting a good um, information in terms of what age has an impact towards level of automation. 
So similar, we see in model two as well, uh, though uh, these two p-values are not significant, but the trend is very similar, is that with increasing age, the interest towards level of automation decreases. Now, what we see in model three, when we essentially take, slice and dice the model with random draws, that means we're interested to understand much more of individual perceptions, taste heterogeneity, then we see that all variables are positive, even though the trend is decreasing, meaning the highest value is at level one. That means given the current type of trucks that we have, we are, conf we are comfortable with that. Then, but, but we're okay with level two, but we have less interest and the interest essentially goes down for higher level of automation. But still, the level of interest is positive in nature, not negative in terms of model one and two. One can argue with, can you increase your draws from 1,000 to 10,000, your numbers might change. We looked into that, it did not change much. So instead of you know, debating much about positive or negative side, as a sign, what I would like to emphasize here is the trend. The trend is that age has a counterintuitive or kind of diminishing effect towards level of automation. That means with increasing age, people do not view higher level of automation is a good sign for their company. But they do see that level two and three, uh, level of uh, level two and level three can provide value to their company is, is what we see. But that's the effect of age only. Now let's look into effect of ownership status. Right now, we I'm not, not providing essentially such type of tables of comparison between models, just making it easy and smoothing to the eyes and, and, and then discussing more results here. So what about ownership? Companies that own fleet, so negative coefficient. It says that they're not that much interested if they have to replace their fleet right now. So. The, the coefficient is significant at p-value of 1%. Uh, what about contract? People who are contracting fleet, that is also a negative coefficient. That means companies who are owning vehicles can hardly incur the cost of buying autonomous trucks. And what we see here is that the absolute value of owning versus absolute value of contracting is twice. That means there is a strong resistance of the fleet owners to, to adopt higher level of automation. Uh, so ownership has higher resistance than uh, people uh, than companies who do who do contractual basis uh, fleet operation. So that's what we see in terms of ownership status, explaining about resistance towards automation. In terms of education level, here we associate cost with uh, with with education as well. So if people responded to the survey having some level of college education. Uh, or no degree, they much more prefer level two. That's what is their positive likelihood with a coefficient value of less than one, but still positive. Associate degree, uh, people having, they, they prefer level three of automation. That's a, again, a positive like, likelihood with a coefficient less than one. What about professional degree uh, or any type of training people having? They prefer level four and five automation compared to lower levels. That is a positive likelihood. So what we see right now in model three, if we look into it, uh, that is the most comprehensive uh, model compared to model one and two. So as we move from scenario one through scenario four, that means from uh, one is most expensive, scenario four is the least expensive. That suggests the impact of education level on adoption likelihood increases with lower technology cost, which is what we would ex expect that People are much more familiar and they would like to adopt much more, but as long as it's, it's less value of cost, meaning less risk to the company. So uh, that's what uh, people with higher degrees understand. And, and that's also we see uh, reflecting in model three. So whatever results we see on this slide, the effect of education on perception towards automation that is significant at p-value of 5% five, five, uh, 5 or 95% uh, level of confidence. So with, with all models. So that's the effect of education. Now let's look into the effect of geographic region. What did we find out? So if we talk into companies located in Midwest, they prefer level five compared to all other levels, always significant at p-value of 5%. If we look into Northwest, then higher significance for level five as well, at p-value of not at 5%, but at 10% with model one and two 
and 20% with model three, which is the mixed logic model in all scenarios, scenarios one through four. When we look into Southern states or Southern com companies located in Southern states, they're significant only for level one. So that means they're mentioning much more towards, we would like to stick with what we have rather than taking any level of automation. So providing or showing kind of conservative approach in terms of Southern states, um, similar to some other findings, we see the behavior and attitude of different type of geographic regions in other studies. And if we look into Southwest, then that is higher significance for level three and, and p-value of 10%. So in terms of employment time, meaning their tenure, let's talk about tenure type one, which is employment time that is less than two years. They, they are much more inclined towards level two automation. Uh, type two tenure, which is five to 10 years, they are higher inclined towards level five automation. So the intensity in which uh, the people prefer level, or level of automation is much more higher for type two tenure. That means as long people are much more established in the company, they're much more preferring towards higher level of automation than a person who is essentially in a leadership role, but did not spend much time with the company. So that is the effect of tenure. So higher experience uh, than, than type two tenure are not significant. That means people who are almost ending their career in a company are not attributing that much towards decision-making that is transformational within, within, within companies uh, next goals. So I would like to kind of uh, not go any further in terms of model details, but there are many variables that, that we see of, of providing us uh, very, in, very much insight so what is the goodness of fit or comparison of three models that we looked into? So, if, so again, the, the blue table uh, is in blue in color telling what are the three models. Uh, the first two are MNLs and the third one is mixed logic. What we see is that uh, if we look into row square values, not that much essentially different, very much similar of model one and two. However, we see the difference in terms of AIC and BIC, meaning Higher row square as well as adjusted row square are better. Lower AIC and BIC are better. So model two is performing a little better than model one, but model three is outperforming both model one and two, which we would expect uh, essentially. Uh, in terms of BIC value, it's, it's more or less in the same ballpark, but we see a higher value of adjusted uh, row square. So, so in terms of conclusion, I took probably almost close to 40 minutes. So I will wrap up very soon in a minute or two. So our goal was to update industry preference towards autonomous trucks. So we designed the survey and uh, came up with a sample size that, that is much more representative. Survey data itself was insightful and we discussed about modeling approach developing 12 models where we analyze the industry perception towards uh, highly autonomous trucks on based on different type of factors that provides us knowledge of what is the what are the OEMs need to do? What is the marketing industry needs to do? Uh, what are the uh, policy uh, policies that various DOT needs to to come up with if they would like to um, essentially enhance the interest of the industry uh, in terms of providing the benefits, in terms of giving them tax incentives? So those are the policies that um, that can be learned as we find out more from from this uh, from this analysis. So what we did for trucks only can be applied to various other type of automated technologies as well, such as you know, many companies working on transit buses. So what are their preferences? Uh, or DOTs looking for roadside units or making the infrastructure smart. What are their perceptions? Or uh, companies looking for last mile deliveries uh, from on FMRI, we had an earlier webinar on this, so we can look into that or companies looking for 3D printing technologies, kind of all organizational level adoption falls in this domain of analysis that one can look into uh, in, in, in future. So what we did here in preliminary work, we had uh, we have uh, two papers on, on this, uh, not exactly what we talked today, but some of the foundational work towards that. Uh, we, we, we have two papers that we looked into, looking more into peer effects, meaning comp company to company interaction, a uh, very different dynamic that we that we uh, started compared to what I presented today. Those who are interested can look into uh, these two papers. The, the 2020 paper, the paper on the right hand side is, is uh, in press, but still available for viewing. It's not fully published with an issue number. 
uh, but 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 we have it there. So I'd like to acknowledge before concluding and before concluding is that while designing the survey, we had a lot of conference calls with ATRI on how to understand trucking industry technology perspective. And I'd like to thank them. In terms of our own people, uh, Jesse Simpson, whose uh, doctoral dissertation is on this topic, and he was the first author, as you saw in the last two papers, that was his work. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Reza Terlebian, he used to be a postdoc, uh, contributed significantly to the survey design and the analysis part. And I would like to thank the overall project team uh, that we're working. This is a much bigger project than what I'm presenting today, is focusing on next generation freight models. And that is a project sponsored by FMRI among three universities. So Dr. Kaiser is at FAU, the PI. My colleague, uh, Dr. Golias, is also involved in this, in this research. And Dr. Figliuzzi at Portland State is also working on the project on mostly on the last mile delivery and, and, and robots. So we're looking into various themes of next generation freight models as a part of this project. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation and take any question. For that, a lot of agencies contributed to funding. Uh, our major source of funding is also our state DOT in Tennessee. Um, so we get a lot of projects from our DOT looking into trucking industry research. I would like to thank for their support. Uh, FMRI, um, uh, sponsored by USDOT Tier 1 Center. Our city also funded, as well as the FedEx Institute on campus, as well as we got some seed funding from our university. So I'd like to thank all the sponsors for supporting uh, this research. So. Uh, yeah, I'd conclude here and Elaine, over to you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sabia. It was a very good presentation. It's really important to understand um, how people will accept the, the new technologies, so it's really interesting. Um, so now we're going to be having a session of questions, so you may either... Uh, type in the chat or you can turn on your microphone and talk. So any questions? Yeah, while while people are thinking about questions, I'd like to, you know, acknowledge some of the or, or some of the ongoing work also going in this domain is that there is there is a lot of work going on that uh, what we saw in today's presentation is more or less what we did as a part of this project collecting you know data uh, as much as possible with the resources that we we have available but there are other activities that is going on uh, that were not part of today's presentation but uh, you know if you know need more information about things those are going on atri is doing a lot of work in, in this area, those are not part of our presentation today that we did not present or uh, that's that that's ATRI's you know data ATRI has has much more you know insight on those, but that there is some work going on in that area that we did not touch upon today. This is the work that was done as a part of this project and a completely different type of data collected uh, with uh, with at the University of Memphis. And looking into that, that data set, what we saw is, is the insights. Yeah, that's very good. That's a very good job. Thank you. Um, so does anyone would like to speak uh, to speak your question? Hi, just to 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 reinforce that um, this presentation, both the presentation slides and the and the the video recording will be available on the FMRI website, and you can also check our future events and also our past webinars recording, in case you have any interest on the the research that we have developed. So since we don't have any questions, right?
Yeah, I hope I did not bore a lot of people um, in the discussion today. I took a little bit of more time, but we still have about eight minutes in case there are questions or I'll, I'll be also happy. Um, uh, my, we have um, one present one question in, in the chat um, from. Yeah, 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 from RVG. Yes, yeah, I will read the questions. Yes, you can yeah. read. Yeah, thank you, Alain. So. It was an interesting presentation. I would like to know if the participants were aware of the long-term e economic impact of automation. So obviously it's an excellent question. What we did is that uh, we presented a lot of background information to the respondents in the survey, but at the same time, we did not want to you know, overload them with a lot of literature during the survey itself. And um, uh, let me see. Dan was uh, from ATR. I was in the call. Okay, Dan is still still with us. He's on mute. And Dan, uh, with discussions with ATRI, what we kind of understood is that trucking industry, uh, you know, people who are in trucking industry business, they are aware of all the technologies those are upcoming, uh, as well as they're aware of the long term economic impact of automation. So we did not want to provide them, you know, a lot of background information, but we did provide them what are the benefits and what are the uh, kind of disbenefits, if you may, uh, of each level of automation, like the slide that I was showing when we provided, you know, features of features of uh, various level of automation. Um, in terms of economic impact, that's a good question you ask, like, uh, the, uh, we're we're hope we were hoping that they they're aware about you know the lifespan operation maintenance cost of those uh, we we thought that they were aware of that but that is a good point that we can look into as well in in future and uh, yeah Dan just uh, just just uh, mentioned something in the chat board is that smaller fleets are less familiar and supportive of ADS technology is is what we, what we find out. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so smaller fleets are less familiar is a message from Dan to us and supportive of ADS technology. What we found out from, from, the, from the national data set, uh, where our larger fleets are very sophisticated because they are larger, larger organization, they have much more complexity in terms of, you know, their, their company composition. So their perception to be, um, you know, some, something to be, you know, of larger companies, complex nature. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, very helpful insight. Dan is very knowledgeable of what, what goes on uh, nationally. So those in audience, if you have questions also, um, Dan would be a very good point of contact, though you can also email you know, us. Um, I would, I have a question. Um, do you know of any um, for example, there are people that are less receptive of this type of technology. Um, are there any programs that are making people aware of the benefits of automation? Can you state the question again, Alain? I, I got distracted while reading the chat board question. Please, please uh, appreciate if you can say. My question is that since there is a, a, a significant group of people that are less uh, receptive with automation, do you know of any strategies that are being applied either uh, to the general public or inside organizations to make people aware of the benefits of automation? Yeah, I, I got your question. Uh, yeah, good question. So uh, actually, again, Dan can speak much more about it, but there are projects going on at the federal level and I cannot you know, talk more about it at this point because these are all confidential a lot of studies are, are going on at national level to understand the industry perception first. And once that understanding is there, then there would be different level of engagement with the companies in terms of you know, benefits, in terms of advertisement, in terms of marketing, providing educational knowledge and, and level. So those you know, will, 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 will come more. So, but it's a good question. You know, we're still in the very early stages of uh, autonomous trucks being kind of already available for, for purchasing. 
uh, it's not that virus features of what we refer here as highly automated uh, trucks. Um, we are talking about those are still at the preliminary stages with some components being available, not the level of automation. So it's a good question Alliance. So it, it's going to come after those studies are complete. So it will be some time before we exactly know what are the you know, legal aspects or what are the marketing aspects or strategy aspects various types of government agencies will, will take for promoting the technology. Alain, would you like to add anything after uh, in that? Uh, did, did I answer your question? Yes, it answers. Um, do you have any comments on the, the chat that you were reading? Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. are okay, I can close it. Yeah, no, I read it. And Dan also answered that. So will the hours of service change for automated trucks from Dr. Verma? So hours of service, uh, Dan mentions that the number of industry entities argue that HOS modified for level four and five trucks, at least get rid of the 30 minute required break. So th th that is also something that will evolve over time. I would say once uh, higher level of automated trucks are operational and there would be input from the drivers with the level of stress that they go on. Uh, with a uh, number of hours of up, uh, hours of service, and based on that, that is something will will kind of change over time. But as Dan rightly mentions, is that number of you know industry uh, partners are arguing that uh, the service uh, hours of service should be modified at least for higher level of automation four and five, and and get rid of the thirty minute required break at least because they can continue with that operation because they're not driving in a stressed environment in their level zero or level one. So level four and five should have modified HOS. So that's that's the what is kind of our kind of intuition says at this point. And of course this is something are all subject to change once the technology is in place. Another point from Dan is that a bigger concern is that civil litigation, large suits against fleets, will move on from human factors, driver errors, suing the OEMs and technology vendors. Extremely important point, Dan. So, you know, who is responsible for 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 something that happens, uh, a, 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 as well as civil litigation? So, is it human factor or driver error, or it is a fault of the OEM or the vendor? So who is responsible for that? So that's also true for you know uh, personal uh, personally owned uh, vehicles as well, uh, like cabs, uh, connected autonomous uh, vehicles operated uh, at a personal level. Similar questions going on there, but that's another you know huge uh, change that will happen is about civil litigation. How that will fold on is something that we have to wait for the. Future once the technology come in and 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 see how it unfolds. That's another challenge that we have to you know deal with in in the future. 